Welcome to Clear Conversations Entrepreneurial Legacies with your host, John Sleeting, an executive partner for Clearwater Capital Partners. Join John and his guests on this exclusive journey behind the scenes of extraordinary entrepreneurial families. In this series, we'll dive deep into the stories of John's guests who generously unveil the paths they've walked, the challenges they've overcome, and the wisdom they've gained along the way. Throughout these conversations, we explore their achievements beyond mere recognition, disclosing the distinctive perspectives that have shaped their entrepreneurial journeys. We hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Clear Conversations, the Entrepreneurial Legacies series. I'm John Sleeting, your host, and today I'm joined by Tom Livergood. Tom is the founder of the Family Wealth Alliance. We'll get into more details about exactly what the Family Wealth Alliance is, but he's had a, a corporate career, uh, and then he went out on his own entrepreneurial journey to found the Family Wealth Alliance. Tom will discuss his why, what motivates him, what keeps him on track, what his North Star is, and why he's so dedicated to focusing on the family as a part of family businesses, family wealth, family offices, and why the family and the human experience is so important to him as he shares his own human journey. So as we dive in uh, in this dialogue, I know you're not going to be disappointed in the end. Tom, welcome. I am so delighted to have this conversation with you today. Thank you for taking the time, coming into the studio, and for us to be able to sit down and go through your own entrepreneurial journey to date and the one that you are still writing for yourself. Well, thanks for having me, John. I was thrilled when you invited me. I'm honored. And if uh, I can share a few nuggets along the way that others can uh, benefit from, we're talking about legacy, right? Yeah, so yeah. if I can share a few nuggets along that'll help people easier down the same path that you and I've been on and others, uh, I think that's great. Well, you've so. meant so much to me, to our firm, Thank to the you. families that we serve and have built into us over these years, but we'll, we'll come back to that later before I, okay. before I digress. So let's start with legacy. Uh, this concept, this thought, this word legacy, what does that mean to you? Yeah. You know, I was thinking about it, and I think ever since human beings rode the planet, they wanted to pass things on to the next generation and make it a little easier. So it was cave wall hieroglyphics, and then it was parchment, and then there was the printed word, right? And now we have recorded, uh, which is an anachronistic term these days, um, but now it's all digital. And yet, whatever the medium is used, I think we still have a need to share an idea, right? Mm. And to leave a legacy for others so that it might be easier down that same path. So I think that's a pretty cool thing that we share with humankind. And, and so then it gets in, to what is important to share? And how do you think about what is important to share? What is important to pass on versus... Uh, you know, I've got a, a friend sometimes that says, you know, well, that's TBU. That's true but useless, right? I, it's, you know, I, information was passed on. How do you think about and distill down what is valuable to pass on and, and not valuables, right? I mean, we're not talking estate planning documents and returns right. and financial assets, but we're talking about more values in terms of what, what yeah. but then there's a filtering of going, here's really what's important. Here's what's important to me that I want to convey. Yeah, it it's really the concept of, this is a lot more important than any one of us. This is bigger than any one of us. So when I started the firm, yes, I was excited as an entrepreneur <laughs> to launch an idea, but it quickly became apparent to me that if we could help firms better serve their clients, then we had a multiplier effect already in place that could extend to thousands and thousands of families. Mm. And that, to me, is the most exciting because it's bigger than me, bigger than bigger you, than you mm. it's bigger than all of us, and that's what legacy is all about. And that, and that takes a lot of humility, you know, to think less highly than one ought to of themselves and the impact that they're going to have versus the ripple effect that could come that it's bigger than just them. If I'm hearing you, if I'm hearing you correctly, yes, uh, it's easy for me to be humble, John. There's three reasons. One is I have tried to play golf 
um, I started my own business, and I'm a father. Yep. And so anytime <laughs> you, you put those three things together, one becomes humble. It, but I going. think uh, beyond that, uh, if, if you can think beyond yourself, then you don't get nervous. You don't think about the risk you're taking. Yeah. You don't feel nervous about getting on stage. You don't feel nervous when you're meeting somebody new because you're putting yourselves in how can I help that person Hmm. do a better job for their family. A service mindset yeah. and turning around and, and adding value to others. Right. And so when you, um, well, let's, let's, let's go. Family Wealth Alliance, you founded it 20 some years ago. Uh, and then from, and then we'll rewind from there, right? So tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about Family Wealth Alliance and what that means. Okay. The Family Wealth Alliance is a, a community of shared values where we put people together uh, and connect them. And so our tagline is, we connect you. We connect you with people, with organizations, with ideas. And the whole purpose is to help you, as a financial advisor, better serve your clients. And so that's what the, the core value of the Family Wealth Alliance. We attract givers, not takers. We have an abundance mentality, as you know. Um, we have people that are willing to share with their direct competitors. And that kind of abundance mentality has permeated the uh, community. And at this point, there's 50,000 end families that are being served by multifamily office wealth management firms, uh, representing about $750 billion of total wealth. Is that yeah, the, about, the number keeps changing because Rachel growing. keeps bringing in new members, <laughs> right? And uh, yet, uh, because of that dynamic, it is a pretty large number. Yeah. And the collaboration that takes place uh, amongst the, the member firms and being there in the dialogue, because uh, I, I really do believe you've, you've created an abundance mindset. You've created an abundance mentality. Because if everyone driving up and down the road stopped in and wanted to be clients of any one of the firms, uh, they, they, there's not enough capacity to, to take That's them right. on. Yeah. So how do we continue to grow and be there and share ideas so that we're all serving to the absolute best of our capabilities for the end families and the end benefit that's there? Because that's the focus is not the end families. It really is the professional services organizations that are serving them. Yeah. And so if you re rewind further, because I want to we'll come back into a little bit of your journey through the last over 20 years with the Family Wealth Alliance. But let's go back to you grew up in central Illinois. You were part of a multi-generational family business yourself. What was that like? Take us through some of the dynamics growing up as a third generation from a, a business your grandfather founded. Well, the, the town I grew up in is 800 people. So the first word that I would use to describe my growing up is boring because it was just flat. <laughs> and uh, as I grew up as a, as a teenager, I just wanted to get the heck out of town and go to college. Uh, which I was fortunate to do at Bradley University. Um, but beyond the boring was a, an instillment of, of values and an instillment that you're going to go places, that you're not going to stay here, you're going to go to college, and you're going to make something of yourself. Mm. And by the way, it's it's will help you with tuition, but it's largely going to be on your dime. Mm. And so that was always an ex that expectation and it wasn't a, um, a, a a pressure situation it was but we expect you to do this mm. <laughs> and so I was always seen beyond the square mile of Findlay Illinois okay. and the greater world and so it was fortunate to, to be instilled with that expectation and values growing up so, so formal education, but then growing up in the in the business and in the family business, third generation, what what were the learnings that you that you took out of just being being part in in and around the family business that you wish people in academia understood, and then and vice versa. Um, when you start a business and when you conduct business, you take risk every day. In our family business, uh, Livergood Grain Company we took risk in the futures markets. So we would take the grain in and store it, dry it, filter it, resell it, uh, but the price could go up or down, and yet the farmer could get uh, their payment any day, uh, or they could hold on to it. And so the hedging uh, in the futures, which my grandfather and great uncle uh, did in the 1930s at, wow. at the Board of Trade, 
Wow. Um, that was the business. And so I remember when beans went from 3 to $9 in a period of months. Hmm. And so uh, what do you do? Do you write it up? Hmm. Uh, because South America had no uh, crop that year, and that was driving up prices. Uh, there was increasing demand for soybeans, uh, for cattle and, and feed for pigs. And so um, the processors wanted it, and so you hedged in the futures. And so what people didn't realize in this little town was the incredible risk that as a, an entrepreneurial family, Livergood Grain took. Yeah. But it wasn't just Livergood Grain. It's, it's businesses all yeah, over, yeah. right? Yeah. And so when, when you take out a mortgage and, and get a new business building and you hire more people and you invest in plant and equipment, you're betting on the future. And I, I think entrepreneurs in, in America and worldwide are optimistic yeah. or they wouldn't be doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's the risk and yet the incredible infectious optimism mm. that things are gonna be good yeah. Yeah. going forward. Uh, and how do you sleep at night with that uh, in the middle? Yeah, and and so the the, the need, you know, the desire for the formal academic um, and some of the theory, but then the theory sometimes goes out the window when you're staring at beans going from three to you know nine dollars, and how that that plays itself out because there's no textbook that tells you. Here's how you should operate. Here's how you should respond. Right, John. Here's how you should think, or here's how you should feel, right? How do you feel in that right. moment because it's counter to. So when you think about risk management, you know, growing up, I mean, you may have not called it risk management, but how how young or how in tune were you at an early age regarding how your family was even navigating some of these risks? Yeah, I remember asking my dad, well, how do you do it? How do you hedge? And he just turned to me and said, Tom, it's an art and a science. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm. And I'll just never forget those words. We talk about fees and pricing and family wealth today, and I use those terms as an yeah. art and a science. Um, but I think what I remember most is that Livergood Green was an influencer in the futures. And so the Board of Trade would take notice if uh, in those years of the seven, early 70s when, when Livergood was long on beans and not short on beans. Hmm. It had risen from, say, three to six. Well, gosh, it doubled. And Livergood is still long on beans. What are they thinking? <laughs> when we use the word influencer today, and when Livergood Grain sold to a Fortune 1000 company at the time, mm. uh, not because of their size, because they were an influencer in the markets, mm. and they got a family that had grown up at the Board of Trade since the 30s and understood mm. that business, and uh, it was because Livergood Grain was an influencer. That's, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, and that's great. It's, it, I mean, it's th those kind of backstories, right? The, and using today's terminology in some ways of saying an influencer that's, but, but we all have influence and how we use that influence for good or, or not so good. Yes. Is some of that tie in with legacy of how you're living that out and the influence you have to make a positive effect, a positive change in the world that you'd like to see in that, that, that currency of, of what influence right. is. So how do you build influence? How do you help others follow, which, you know, we could call it leadership too, um, but how do you build that influence out in, in the broader world around you? And I'm not uh, talking followers on YouTube or followers on anything, right? It's, yeah, but, no. But real influence to affect Yeah, change. I think influence starts with ideas, and I think it starts with seeing where the buck is headed and seeing around the corner. And I think you get a reputation for being able to extrapolate current events out into the future, and what are the driving forces mm. uh, that will affect and shape the future going forward. Uh, and I think for some reason, Family Wealth Alliance has been able to do that, just mm -hmm. like Livergood Grain was able to do it yeah. uh, years ago for almost 40 years. And um, people have said very kindly, uh, Tom, you you guys have a sixth sense. Mm. You just have a feeling where things are going and what's going on, and and uh, very proud of that. Uh, so, so, where do you think you hone that? I mean, some of it maybe maybe in the genes from your you know your great grandfather I, and father, and I just think it's pretty logical. I think if you just look and see what's going on, you just kind of see where it's headed. I mean, uh, 
you know, the the demand for client centric advice, as you know, John, is a long term curve. Mm-hmm. That's a secular, very long term and, and that's not going away. Mm-hmm. And so the more people feel safe in the firm and trusting in the firm that they're getting truly objective advice as right. well as the best advice, uh, that's going to play into the hands of the client-centric firms. Right. So when you grew up in the family business and then you went off to school and, and focused on formal education, both at the undergrad and graduate uh, levels, uh, where, where did your career take you uh, from there? What was, what was next when you finished up your formal education? Um, I like to think I like to say that I, I grew up in a family business and then I grew up in this business. Hmm. So as you know, I started out of MBA school as a financial advisor in nineteen eighty in the streets of Peoria, Illinois. And uh, it was a great learning experience because I learned that people wanted advice and were willing to pay for that advice. Hmm. And so I first honed my skills just learning that trade, if you will, of being a financial advisor in Peoria and then later transferring my business up to the Chicago area and continuing then. And it was great because I could work with business owners and see what they were going through. I worked with a number of physicians um, and it was really plotting the path forward that they couldn't see that perhaps I could see for them. Mm -hmm. And we would extrapolate the numbers and say, hey. And I remember working uh, with retiring airline pilots later at Harris, and we would say, hey, you're going to be going on your last flight. Let's make sure you don't run out of fuel. And we got their attention pretty quickly (laughs) with that statement, and we did that. And so you were with some... You know, very large institutions are, uh, you know, early coming right out of school. So going from family business, growing up there, academia, now into major corporations. What was the the cultural aspect of being in these large businesses and yet operating somewhat independently with the families that you were serving? Was there a bit of a culture shock in that at all or change or what were your life lessons learned? Yeah, I think any time we make as human beings change, there's always a a culture shock. I I went back and wrote down the values that I was taught uh, growing up, and it was treat people like you want to be treated, which is really the second commandment that Christians would learn over love your neighbor like yourself. So I was taught that, and uh, as Cigna, it was uh, serve first. And, and that was the mantra that was taught to me, uh, you know, growing up as a financial advisor uh, at the Harris Bank uh, in the 90s. It was uh, Honesty and Fair Dealing hmm. by N.W. Harris hmm. uh, when he founded uh, Harris Bank in 1863. Um, later, when I founded the firm, our core value and, and, and our tagline, we place families first. Uh, interestingly enough, now that we agreed to be acquired by Schwab, the core value is through client size. Mm. And what a thread. What mm. a common, cool thing from treating people like you deserve to be treated, right? Yeah, yeah. To serving first, to honesty and fair dealing, to we place families first through uh, seeing through client size. Uh, you know, how lucky could I get? So in, in the thread there is the human experience. Exactly. Right. And so even founding the Family Wealth Alliance, I think a lot of individuals will go to the wealth when they when they listen to it or even hear the name. Right. It's like, well, it's a wealth alliance. And it's about the dollars and cents. and It's about the pile of money and it's about uh, the, the legal documents, tax returns, et cetera, and how you deal with that. But you've always always have encouraged put put family first family before you know family business it's family first family wealth it's family first so family office it's family first um where does that focus uh on the human side of this of this topic of wealth uh come from at your core because that is a a common thread that i've observed in who you are i don't know if you've read the book um family uh wealth by jay hughes Mm-hmm. Uh, I was fortunate enough to write a blurb for his second edition. Okay. And Family Wealth, Keeping It in the Family is the total. Uh, and I read that book uh, before I founded the firm. 
and it gave me the inspiration to name the firm not the multifamily wealth or the MFO alliance, but the Family Wealth Alliance. And it was really about the concept of uh, the the European uh, definition of wealth is your health and your family. Hmm. And so I lashed onto that as to what hmm. you just said, uh, that family wealth is about a, a, a greater sphere of a family's sustainability. And and he wrote that about that, overcoming the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves in three generations. So that inspired me to name our company the Family Wealth Alliance. And and I think you stayed true to that. I didn't know you back in you know on day one. Thank but looking you. back on that, if that was the founding principle. It was. You know, we we've we met about five years ago now. And so so I think you stayed true to that. And and that's hard to do in running any organization is staying true to your initial vision for an organization because of all the pressures, all the risks that have to be managed, the pressures, the gaining members from being by yourself uh, on day one. Um, and that's a testament in and of itself in terms of oh, your, you. your focus and your vision for the organization. Yeah, and if I may actually disagree with you, I thought it was Wouldn't be the, the first easiest. Time. <laughs> I thought it was easiest to stay to our core value. It was harder to persevere when things got tough. Hmm. And when you saw all the things coming at you and all the people and all the money, I think what was easiest was actually staying to our core value hmm. because that was our North Star. And through all the thick and thin, that was the easiest to look at and remember when tough decisions yeah. you know, would come. Well, in... And so I'm in agreement with you in terms of the. <laughs> I knew you would because uh, because I think that is if you have your belief system in place, which you did, it's right. easier to stick to it. And and yet, so many organizations deviate from what that that core mission is and that core vision is. And there's there's a lot of stories that were captured actually in a book written by Peter Greer called Mission Drift, where it people would just look at it and one degree off every day or every month ends up way off course using my sailing analogies, you end up way off course if you, if you deviate and you allow for that one degree uh, off course early on. And that's where, when the founder says, this is our core value, people remember that. So when Chuck yeah. Schwab at the Schwab Corporation says that, people remember that. Mm -hmm. And so when N.W. Harris said that in 1863, about the Harris Bank, honesty and fair dealings, or when John Smith said it, the, the legacy company of Cigna served first, mm -hmm. people remember that. When I say we place families first, that is what we will do. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and people and remember of, that, yeah. and, and it gets you back on course to that North Star navigation terms. Yeah, and that's where actually leadership and culture exactly. are rallying around yeah. that point. If it gets reiterated and restated, and then the actions reinforce the words. So go back to those early days. Day one, you decided you're going to found the Family Wealth Alliance. You came up with a name, right? And that's harder than most people think. You come up with the name of the organization. Uh, but but what were you feeling? What were you sensing? What was the real catalyst to say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, and this is the way I'm going to do it, and it's going to be an organization that is easy for somebody to say, this is mine, my business, I created it, my name's on the door. But again, that's not your spirit, Tom. That's the part I want listeners to really understand. There's one thing to having the ambition and the drive and to go off and create, and yet doing it from a position of humility and giving and serving others first and putting them is more important to go do that. So, so take listeners back to how did you actually, those early days, how did you really get this launched? Well, first of all, when you start a business, you got to be half crazy because <laughs> no one in their right mind would start a business from a financial and risk standpoint. But when you get beyond that <laughs> and you get excited about your North Star, then it, then, then you get caught up in the moment, right? So uh, I was fortunate to be have launched the first ever MFO, multifamily office community, uh, at uh, Family Office Exchange. I was given the terrific opportunity by the founder, Sarah Hamilton, and so I ran that uh, for a little under two years. And um, I just saw some opportunities to do a little differently and uh, take our core value forward uh, and my belief system. And so I launched it uh, in uh, 2003 
was the belief that if we can stick to our core value, but also from an opportunistic standpoint, I thought the multifamily office model was the most sustainable model in all of family wealth. As you know, we, we've seen single family offices having been formed since the Rockefeller days and the Pitcairn, you know, over 100 years ago, right? Um, but is that a sustainable business model? Because that dedicated, as you know, to one set of households with a common gene pool and original wealth. The multifamily office model was predicated on the fact that people didn't have the inclination or the scale to have their own family office and hence putting people together that are unrelated and with scale deliver a family office experience. And I thought, man, that is a sustainable business model. And not only is it a sustainable business model, it's a sustainable business model to serve that community, right. to grow that community, to develop best practices. And I saw that as a really long-term wave. Yeah. In, in, there's a, a few different items here. Yeah, I want to make sure I don't lose my thoughts. Uh, early on, and I don't want to project this, so I'm just curious uh, from you. Early on, because you were a certified financial planner, you were working directly with families. You were, right. Was there anything in your, you know, your internal calculus you were going through that your insight, your your time, your ta- could be better leveraged by influencing and leading others to have more of an effect on more families? Because we said if Family Wealth Alliance is serving fifty thousand families, right? Tom, with all due respect, you couldn't serve 50,000 families directly yourself. So is, was there something in that leverageability of, of you creating an organization that was serving the people that were serving the end families? Oh, without question. I mean, that's what I mean by the multiplier effect. Yeah. I knew that if we could get this right and help firms better run themselves as well as better serve their families with best practices, then tens of thousands of families Although I don't know that I ever did the math and figured out that it would be, you know, that many families with that many billions Mm. behind their names. Mm. I just knew that it was a lot, uh, which doesn't sound very (laughs) scientific, more (laughs) art than science, right? Right, right. Uh, But I knew that was something. But I'll go back to, if you don't mind me rewinding the videotape a little bit, back in the years when I was a financial advisor, would oh and you know we have these seminal moments in our lives, and this was one of them. Hmm. I got a call in 1985 from a doctor client of mine in Peoria. I'd moved my practice to Chicago, and he said, um, "I have just uh, read my own chest X-ray." He was a pulmonologist. Hmm. He said, "I have uh, 12 to 15 months to live." He said, uh, my cancer from skin cancer years ago has, has spread and it's in my lungs. And I have my oncologist, I have my minister, um, I have my uh, marriage counselor uh, mm-hmm. dealing with grief with my family, and I have you, my financial advisor. Mm-hmm. And I want you to pull everything together and make sure that my family is going to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. And so I'm barely 30 years old. Hmm. I am five years into this, and we have made all kinds of projections as a financial planner for, you know, lots of families. Right. But boy, that became real. Yeah. And so I was honored by delivering his last financial plan hmm. to he and his wife, hmm. and assured him that she, the kids, would go to college that she would not have to remarry, that she could be financially independent. Mm. And the peace that they give, that gave him before he passed was huge. Yeah. It was super difficult. It was just the proudest moment I'd ever had yeah. as him career-wise. And so that and a few other seminal moments, if we get to them, yeah. really has always driven me and I will never forget that. And so we can talk about driving forces. We can talk about, you know, billions of dollars. We can talk about all the cool things. But when it really gets down to helping each family, hmm. that is the most meaningful thing we can do. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that's where sometimes you'd want to, you know, grab certain families. They're like, well, this is important. This is not urgent. And they push off 
certain work that we just believe is so so critical to to living well, right? And it's not again about the the documents, the plans. It's but but to live with confidence, to live with peace, to live with joy, to live with that sense of abundance because no one knows how their days are limited. Yeah. And, uh, and and no one gets out of this world unscathed in terms of eventually we, we get to that point. But when you see it, someone where you feel like it's before their time, a young person, yeah. somebody maybe in the prime of their working years and, and how they're approaching it, but, but life still happens to people. And even the healthiest people that know what they're doing when they're reading their own x-rays, uh, there's, there's nothing they can change at that point in time in life and, uh, and without health and family well, these, these other tools are tools to be used to facilitate those things and the meaningfulness of, of that work. So fast forward then to founding the firm, I had an inkling of a multiplier effect mm. and how could we could reach families. And uh, if you read Greg Curtis's Family Capital book, he talks mm. about the wonderful gift that many wealthy families have done in giving back philanthropy mm-hmm. to, to the world. And so if we can better help families, it really shapes the entire fabric of this country yeah. by these families wanting to get back. Yeah. And that really, really uh, stuck with me for a long time. So, so we'll circle back on the, the philanthropic aspect okay. of, of the discussion. Um, you created Family Wealth Alliance. You started it. You you know have the, the focus, the leverage capability, but help Help listeners that may not be familiar with some of the terminology. Um, you mentioned single family office, multifamily office, wealth management, financial advisors. Uh, do a real quick glossary for individuals. What are we actually talking about when it comes to those subjects? Yeah, it's it's really about net worth and complexity, and how people fall on that two dimensional graph is the best way I can describe it. And so, if you're, you know, you've got a million or two million, and you're a retired Sears exec from way back when in the Chicago area, uh, you you probably need a financial plan and an estate plan and and some reporting of, of how your assets are invested, right? And you do a retirement plan, and you figure out how much to take out of your IRA, and that's about it. But if you've got $200 million, uh, that's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the uh, the issues are different. Uh, in fact, it's about 30 to $40 million. Uh, we find that most generations won't spend uh, all that money, <laughs> and they'll pass it on to the next generation. Mm. And what happens is then you need a more complicated estate plan. You need more uh, investment categories to diversify the portfolio. You end up, as you know, John, uh, creating different tax entities, mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then the reporting on all those tax entities and investments become more complex. And so complexity with net worth goes up exponentially mm-hmm. as you go out that, out that curve. Right, right. And so just like the cruise missile hovers over the terrain and uses GPS and its own internal maps to triangulate what is going at about two-thirds mock and some now go hypersonic right and so how do those cruise missiles work that they're doing and on the trajectory and what financial advisors do is they hug the terrain of their clients and because they're so client-centric they'll do what their clients need and so for the two million dollar client they get really really good at retirement plans Uh, we worked with retiring airline pilots at the harris and brought in 800 million dollars from all these Delta and American Airlines pilots, crazy, right? All over the country. But you never want to uh, lose fuel on your last flight, right, right, right? right? But when you're working with a $200 million family, you're doing many other things. And so that team, working with just $200 million clients, gets really good as that cruise missile hugs the terrain, right. and they get very good. And so what has happened is that this landscape, you've heard me talk about it at our events, this landscape's evolved over time. And that evolution of the financial advisor to best serve their clients has evolved, and they've come up the learning curve of the art and science of serving families. So if you're a $2 million family, you have certain needs. You're a $20 million family, 
$200 million, $2 billion. And so you go up that complexity needs. An entire industry gets evolved and formed, and we've just grown up in that business. So you think about segmenting the, the world um, and your focus um, you could have created an organization that was focused on a lot of individuals with, call it two million, you know, each, right? Or you know, and we realize, and sometimes we even get lost in your own numbers, right? I know. Most of the world doesn't, you know, even live on the two million dollars, right? We just went down to two million, two, right? Right, and so that's and, that, and that's where exactly. we stopped. Uh, so recognizing that it's not to minimize anyone, and I know you don't, and that's not your heart in this, but there's an aspect of going, okay, but. But there is complexity that comes in. There is the opportunity where you know money can corrupt. Money can uh, be used for non-noble activities. Uh, but you, so you decided when you focused to say you were going to focus at the upper echelon of the wealth spectrum in terms of see, serving the professionals, not the end families, but serving the professionals that serve those families. Yeah, we're B two B, so we don't work with families. I miss working with families. Uh, but we only work with the firms. Uh, we're concentrated on the multifamily wealth community. So it's that that band from 30 million to 300 million that it's about 90% of the bell curve. There's some billionaire families that are served by our member firms, uh, but that gets into kind of that single or private family office where you have a dedicated staff for the original wealth, the original gene pool of mm-hmm. multiple households that serve us private or single family office. And so we have some members in that category, but ours is kind of that big middle of yeah. family wealth firms yeah. that are serving families that A, don't have an inclination to do that themselves, they don't have the scale to have their own dedicated staff, and they uh, value trusted advice and are willing to pay for it. Yeah. That's the psychographic of the client that our members are serving. In in, uh, in a single family office, um, just a little bit more definition for uh, for for listeners to try to get their head around this is uh, single family offices are single biological families up to ten generations, and that was defined coming out of Dodd Frank, coming out of the financial crisis, uh, and uh, the SEC was charged with actually putting more terminology and definition. So, so that is actually a really recent development to try to get more clarity and more definition around what gets used out in the world regarding family office services, right? Which, which everyone wants to market to the family office. And single family offices are now defined by uh, the SEC. Uh, and once you enter into a second family, there's a registration with the SEC as a registered investment advisory firm to, to carry that on and serve two families, so multiple families, multifamily office in the professional services aspect of, of what those organizations are doing. What do you believe makes up a, a, an, an ideal or a best-in-class uh, multifamily office? Um, it's a good question. Uh, we actually, as you know, uh, wrote all that down <laughs> back in 2005, because we kept ask, getting asked that question. And so we created the MFO standards in 05 and published them in 06. And you know I'm a big fan. That's why I asked yeah. the question, right? And, <laughs> uh, we couldn't define it by net worth, just solely alone. We couldn't define it uh, of net worth, sir. We couldn't define it as far as the service menu, although that was important. Uh, we couldn't define it by the firm itself and the professionals and all the letters uh, after their name. And we couldn't just define it as far as the experience of the firm. Uh, but taking those four dimensions together, we found that that four dimensional model worked really mm-hmm. well. And so uh, the single best determinant is a firm's experience in serving 30 million net worth and up clients. Uh, for a number of years and serving a minimum of 10 families at least. So experience of that cruise missile hugging the yeah. terrain over the years, you, you learn by doing, mm. right? Um, but it's those four dimensions together that created the MFO standards published in 06, republished in 2020, we dusted it off um, and, and really revised very little. And so it's pretty timeless, kind of like the speed of light, doesn't change. 
Well, so, so you founded the firm day one. You announced to the world, "This is your focus. You're going to focus on right uh, the, these." And everyone started lining up and joining. Is that how that worked? And I like to think so. <laughs> it wasn't that easy. Uh, although uh, you were at our our 20th anniversary gala, and we actually put up the logos of the 32 founding firms, mm. and it was pretty cool to look at that. Uh, we actually had some firms leave us after they joined. And what was cool is that they came back, many of them. Uh, in fact, 80% of the firms that left came back, oh, wow. which was pretty cool. They finally came to their senses, I guess. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, we talked, we, you and I have talked about leadership. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm not good enough to, to lead on my looks. So how, how do you lead? You lead with an idea. Mm. And so I've always thought that if you could get people to follow your idea and your beliefs and your values, that was a lot easier than any one person. Plus, I always thought it was a lot more sustainable after you're not around. Mm -hmm. And so we led with the idea of serving families first by putting together a peer community of like-minded firms serving the same kind of clients in a nascent industry, right? Like financial planning was that I grew up 20 years prior, right. this was a nascent way of getting peers together to, to figure out best practices, to publish research, do benchmarking, and that was really how it started. Wait, so you, you shared earlier, you know, being humble about things, starting a business, your golf game, and, and family. Let's not so, talk about my so, golf so game. So you think about family business, family comes first, true for you too, right? And this yeah. is the aspect of of individuals that you're serving have their own families and how they're processing and working through these matters. You launch a business, uh, you, you know, you, if it's half crazy or whatever in terms of taking on that kind of a risk, how did the dialogue play out back with your family when you decided that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go launch this? Um, I, I, I think as far as my siblings and uh my mom, who was still alive at the time, there was a, a probably a greater understanding than of my core family because they had not grown up in it like I had. Mm. So I think that was number one. I think number two was that uh, they knew I was a little crazy on the side, that I was pretty entrepreneur, that I was good at starting things. Whether I was good at finishing things was another story. And so... Entrepreneurs are wired to start and to believe and have this infectious optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. And so, um, but it, it wasn't easy um, because I had always succeeded at everything I touched. And so right out of the box, I was leading a league of mistakes mm -hmm. and did several face plants before I finally got it right and longer than most people would actually even believe. Hmm. So. And so now, looking back, it's always easier to look back in the moment. Yes, thank God. Um, was it the North Star you know, concept of, of the idea uh, that was allowed you to, to stick to it and what you were working through even when mistakes happen? Because mistakes do happen. This is It's not that mistakes aren't going to happen. It's not that there's quote-unquote failures. Uh, that are going to come along, but but how you respond to those and, and how you move forward. If you can put yourself back into those moments 20 plus years ago, um, how how are you processing that by yourself? It's the other thing, right? It's really a lonely place when you found a business, you're there staring at yourself in the mirror. It, it's a very lonely place. How are you processing it at that time? Yeah, I, 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 I knew the why, it, w it was to serve the families, and so to, to enable the firm to better serve the families. That was really the why. And so, uh, you know, as many uh, uh, terrific speakers talk about the why, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew the why, I just didn't know the how. And so it was not a linear route, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we really didn't get it right until about 14, 15 years into it, believe it or not. And how would you define right? Uh, believing in people that they could do it better than me. You tell yourself, of course, that's the case. Uh, but until you actually turn over the reins and actually believe in those people, 
um, it doesn't come easy. Second mm-hmm. would be the replicability of the business model. And the third would be the recurring revenue stream of really believing in that enterprise building value, mm-hmm. miracle of recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's really the people, the process, mm-hmm. and then your business model. Until I got all things, three things right, John, it took me 15 years, hmm. and then it clicked. And then you still had several more years in terms of being independent, and then you had mentioned that there's, you know, the, the relationship with Schwab evolved into a, a new relationship. Um, can you share a bit more about that, of like how that took place and how you thought, because we've got a lot of business owner clients uh, that are thinking about potentially they're planning succession, whether it be in the family, but also to a to a third party. Um, how did that play out in your mind of saying, "No, I gave birth. Now it's actually working." Fifteen years later, right? It's clicking. It is now. It's now right. And yet, several years later, you find yourself in a new place. Yeah. Uh, well, better be lucky than good, like my <laughs> golf game. I was invited in '07, just four years into the business to speak at Schwab's Impact. Mm -hmm. And as you know, for listeners who are not familiar with Impact, it's their big industry, you know, thousands of financial advisors are there, right? So it's a pretty big stage. And um, I was discovered by Schwab and was asked to speak for the first time on the topic of family office in 07. And it was a breakout and I thought, okay, it's a breakout, 40, 50 people. There's 400 people in the room, it's staying room only. Wow. And uh, it was fun. And it was fun to tell people <laughs> about it, right? Once you get over the initial, wow, well, it's 400 people in here. <laughs> and uh, I knew then that they could be a potential strategic partner. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they had to find their way through the path to get there. A uh, big rival of theirs, Fidelity, had a 10-year head start on them. And so they knew they were going to get there, and they kept checking back in with me on their journey. And they had turnover, just like everybody has. And they finally settled on a commitment to family office, created the family office group, and um, hired uh, their first head of it, uh, Eddie Brown. Uh, Fortunately, I knew Eddie when he was at Fidelity, and we were friends, and He uh, claims his first ever family office conference was ours. I actually believe him. He actually uh, claims that he called his wife before he called me, and I said, you better not have. (laughs) Uh, But he was excited, and so was I. So then it really ramped up, right? And we just started doing stuff together, research and events and sharing stuff and helping each other out, and, and we could quickly see. A little bump in the road came with COVID in 2020, and uh um, while a very scary thing, it actually made us scalable overnight. You remember up at that time, we were doing in-person events only, very, very little on the virtual side. We converted to every Friday virtuals, uh, just check-ins with uh, COVID, and we had all kinds of listeners. Yeah. Uh, just couldn't believe the numbers. Yeah. And so uh, we actually tripled our revenues mm-hmm. in three years. Um, but everything was in place. The five-year plan was in place. Remember, it was all clicking. I had the right people, the right leadership, the right business model, the right process, the recurring revenue stream. And so what it did was just an accelerant. Uh, you know, the astrophysicists will calculate out at Caltech, you know, that, well, if we want to go to Mars or, you know, to, to Saturn, the outer planet, we got to slingshot ourselves around Mars, right? So... The, for us, the slingshot was COVID. Okay. So it became scalable overnight, and our members became scalable overnight. So yeah. we would get these phone calls that, Tom, we just brought in a $200 million client. We, we haven't even met him yet in person. <laughs> and so suddenly, firm post-COVID became scalable. Yeah. And so yeah. everybody Technology, got slingshotted, everything. right? Yeah. And so it was just this wonderful uh Luck is opportunity makes meets preparation, right? And so our preparation was already in place. It was just that slingshot opportunity, and and suddenly Schwab saw saw us as a growth hmm. vehicle, uh, this wonderful community. Fortunately, we kept our north star, so we had a reputation. We were cranking out great research, 
And um, I had bought out my angel investors. We had named Rachel our president by then. And so everything was in place to mm -hmm. say, do I want to drop my kid off at college, if you will? And, and the last piece of that succession plan, that transition, was the ownership piece. Okay. And then could my kid continue? And so the beautiful, unbelievable American mm -hmm. dream came true, just like Liver Good Grain mm -hmm. was seen by an influencer of a Fortune yeah. housing company. Yeah. And it's hedging in the 1930s on the Board of Trade. We were seen at Family Wealth Alliance as being a terrific influencer in the market and an innovator in the market, sold to a 200, hmm. Fortune 200 company. And so that was a cool thing to link up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as one's, you know, growing up, right? And, and, and who would have thought? But it, it just all converged, to be honest. So Schwab is our primary custodian as an independent uh, firm, um, but but not all the member firms of Family Wealth Alliance have to be. It's not a requirement that they're at Schwab, correct? I mean, you, it's it's custodian neutral in terms of how Family Wealth Alliance operates within the family office space. Is that? I just want to you know, make so, that distinction. Uh, back up that videotape, 2019. I first met Chuck Schwab in person. At a, at a small event at their San Diego Impact I was speaking at. And I could see the core values permeating through the company. Uh, that, that was important. Uh, and so when we started negotiating the deal uh, and when we made the announcement on January 23rd, we said these three things are in place. One is that uh, we will be custodial neutral. Second of all, we safeguard the information that we collect from our members. I believe it or not, Schwab to this day has not seen a member list, mm. <laughs> let alone all the research and the private information we collect mm. from you and all our members. Uh, that, that's a big firewall right there. Yeah. And third is they kept the brand and the people. Mm. How many Fortune 200 companies do that? And so people say, well, what the heck did they get out of this deal? <laughs> and I go, I'll tell you what they get out of this deal. They get independence and they could have spent tens of millions of dollars and taken more than 20 years and still not gotten right. to the model community that we so proudly put together right. with the support of our members, right? right. Being right. member-driven, right, is what we are, everything through the client's eyes. Right. So you can have all the business agreements in place, you can have all the promises in place, but what we have is sustainable, is alignment. Yeah. We have alignment between the two of us that, yes, this makes sense because this is the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm smiling, playing back, because even before this transaction, we, when we became a member firm, it was actually uh, Jill Matesic, who's part of the family yeah, office group. I remember. And, and, you know, I talked to Jill, and Jill's like, John, just... Just call Tom and the Family Wealth Alliance team, right? Because they are they are the best in this space mm -hmm. to be addressing some of the questions as we were evolving as a firm and thinking about how do we better serve the families that we're serving and those like them. Uh, and it was still the best thing, but it really demonstrated before, and I'm glad to hear it's continuing, that independence where Jill's like, don't listen to us. Talk to Family Wealth Alliance because they're going to be able to equip you best. And, and that's true. All right, so if we pause for a second, I just want to th say thank you again. Thanks. I want to say thanks to Jill, too, if she's listening, right? But thanks to you and the team and Rachel and Brooke and uh, just uh, everyone, because I'm sure I'm not going to name but, everybody. Brandon Lynn on the research, Emily on the follow-ups. They you. just keep going down the list of your team thank is you. fantastic. Aren't and, they? Uh, and yeah, and service. they really, we all take real joy at serving yeah. you and the other 80 members. I mean, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's fantastic. To be in that seat, right? Yeah, yeah, and we've uh, we've learned so much Thank you. for the sake of benefiting the families we, we're serving, right? Because no one, that's no one has about. time to go to a conference. No one has time to be sitting around if there's not value being created back to the families that we're serving. Yeah. Um, you, you have this unique perspective in a lot of different dimensions. You sat in the advisory chair, the story that you shared, the seminal moment, uh, that you went through sitting alongside uh, an individual. Uh, you created a business, you grew a business, and you've transitioned a business. You're still involved, but you've you know, transitioned that ownership um, piece. Uh, you look at the world through a financial planning lens and how you look at that. There's a lot of business owners uh, that I come in contact with 
like, okay, after the event, we'll, you know, John, we'll, we'll talk. But until then, I'm heads down in the event. I'm like, you're, you're, you're missing so many opportunities. How would you come alongside an entrepreneur that's looking towards a monetization and a liquidity event at some point in the future in terms of how they're thinking about their planning and taking the steps and preparing for and getting ready for a moment, which is not just a financial transaction. It's an emotional moment. It's psychological. It's hand, you know letting letting the college student go, uh, and it's financial as well. And there's tax implications and planning. What not advice because this is not advice for all the compliance team that are li- listening in. Uh, but what encouragement would you give to others in terms of how they're approaching uh, their business, their growth cycle, and leading up to a potential event? Well, I go back to the other part that makes me up is growing up in a family business and then seeing the heart-wrenching decision to sell the business when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And my brother and cousins were active in the business, and they found out just days before the announcement. They were not consulted on the sale. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine they were a little upset. Mm -hmm. And while the family came back together, uh, because my dad and uncle, second generation, were wearing their business hat, uh, and uh, maybe they didn't know how to communicate on the using the family head of the hat. Mm. Um, but I, I, I just know what that felt like. Uh, and uh, so fast forward to working at the Harris, a lot of M&A deals, saw what families would go through. They later set up their own family business, but the emotional part mm. uh, is always hard to go through. So... To answer your question and talking to any, any entrepreneur, because I'm an entrepreneur first, I happen to pick the family wealth industry to right. work in. Right. Chuck Schwab is an entrepreneur first. He happened to pick the custody business and the uh, individual investor business first. Right. Uh, but whatever business one is choosing, uh, being a creator, it's just part of you, right? right. And it's part of the family the extended family, and, right. and they value it more than you would think. Right. And so I, I think I would just ask any entrepreneur, why are you considering a sale of a business? And have you looked at other options before you look at selling it? Hmm. Uh, right. And I think I could help any entrepreneur with that thought process having been through it and having had my family go through it and watch the videotapes of, I don't know how many families I've dealt with professionally in selling their business. So um, it it can be tough, but I think the why behind it and have you looked at the other options first before you pull the trigger on the sale is really important because I think you have to be really at peace with your decision. Mm. I am incredibly at peace with dropping my kid off to college, uh, but not everybody is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's not just financial readiness. There's yeah. all these other areas, and and the planning opportunities that can come into play if you're doing it in advance versus what would happen on a a you know post event closing. Uh, uh, thought process because it does take time to prepare on, it does. on on multiple facets. But then when you get to that that time, and you're still involved with Family Wealth uh, Alliance uh, heavily, but as as you look forward, two things: uh, how do you look forward for for Tom and family, and what is your hope for the uh, family wealth uh, industry? I'd call it right because it's the, the education that's taking place. The collaboration that's taking place in the rooms that Family Wealth Alliance is hosting. What's your hope for the future decades, generations within the family wealth space? Uh, and then also, what does that what does it what's it mean for Tom into the future? Well, the first one's easy. I just want to see Family Wealth Alliance be sustainable. Mm. And through buying out my former partners and naming Rachel president, and now handing off the ownership to Schwab. It's got a real fighting chance to be sustainable, hmm. and that's that's exciting to me. And so I think Family Wealth Alliance, with the alignment with Schwab, has the best chance to sustain for decades, that a lot longer than I could have done it, John. So that's a pretty cool thing to think yeah. about. So as you drop your kid off at college and they get an education and they grow up into the next working space, but for the... For the next generation of, of 
of advisors, I think that's easy too. You know, you and I are Gen 1 in family wealth. Mm. We are passing on our process, our wisdom and legacy to the next gen. Mm. And so the 30s and 40-somethings, right, are coming into leadership, and they'll take over long after you and I are gone. Mm. And so our hope is that that next generation will carry on the values of serving families yeah. Yeah. for decades to come, right? Yeah. Isn't that our hope? Right. right. I mean, wouldn't that be cool right. if that could just get better and better and better and look what's happened in 20 years? Right. And so for me, the passing on of the Family Wealth Alliance to somebody who will sustain it and sees the value in that alignment is also in parallel with the industry of us handing off baton to the next generation of advisors and leaders yeah. that will run that for the next generation of families. I mean, yeah. that is our legacy. Yeah, but the, and the demographics of the industry, though, are tilted in the opposite direction. More older individuals in the advisory business, and there are younger uh, coming into it. And there's more and more programs we're seeing, CFP programs in colleges and universities, but that, but that dynamic of making sure you have the, the right young talent that's coming in, why? Because that's what our families look like, the families that we're serving, that have uh, uh, from, from you know, newborn, whether they're grandchildren or immediate children, through the college age, through the 20s and 30s themselves, uh, there, there's a dynamic that's there that we have to come alongside the families in the totality across the generations to make sure that we're also speaking their language and that we're connecting with them and what it means because there's also confidentiality and discreteness and how we approach what's shared between family members and generations that's the family's business to be sharing and yet being an outlet back for the family members so that they're also coming uh, to knowledge and coming to understanding of what does it mean to be in a subsequent generation where your, 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 your scenario of being, I was third generation in the family business but I was also first generation in creating what you've created. Yep. And I always look at it and go, subsequent generations that think like first generations are set up for great success. They may have a head start in life, but they're set up because they're thinking like a first generation. That's right. Not wealth creation for the sake of wealth creation, but they're thinking about how do you solve problems? How do you manage risk? How do you look at the world around you? That's the value in that, in that equation in my mind. Um, well said. When you when you look forward, something you know we uh, we mentioned earlier, but I want to come back to is this concept of philanthropy and giving back, and what does it mean? Whether it be a good corporate citizen, a just a good citizen as an individual, as a family, how how do you look at this concept of philanthropy? Well, it's closely tied to legacy. It's closely tied to you know writing on the cave wall and then hieroglyphics and then uh, you know uh, what we form communication today, but. Regardless of the medium, it's it's passing on a set of values so that the next generation is better able to carry that out. Mm. And it's also taking care of people less fortunate mm. than ourselves. So um, right now, what I've determined is that as a business owner, I was able to employ a lot of people and affect a lot of lives that way. And so my first giving back has always been through my business. Mm. The second is that now that I'm financially more able to give back, I've started to do that. Mm. Uh, third is that I want to find, uh, with my wife Debbie and me, some causes that are near and dear to our hearts, as well as my extended family, mm. that we can work toward and give our time as well as our financial capital. Mm. Um, I haven't really formed all that yet, uh, because I'm still dropping my kid off college and making sure that, <laughs> that everything is in place. Uh, because if I don't do a good job there, then I've failed that first mission. So I'm still completing the first mission before I go on to the second. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's what's most important to me right now. Well, as we were speaking previously, we were just talking about good, good giving is hard. Because uh, you know, a lot of people might step back and even and just hear your response be like, well, what do you mean? Just write a check to an organization or write a check. I mean, there's a lot of great organizations out right. there that just do that. Um, but I, I don't believe that that's good giving. I think good giving can be strategic. Good giving can be 
like you created Family Wealth Alliance. There's more leverage in yes. making good gifts, uh, but it also has to be wise, meaning you do have to lend that that time into it to do your due diligence as you would an investment well, in saying, here's a good and, organization to get And to. I'd want to serve on some boards and mm-hmm. be a volunteer where I could have a multiplier effect, yeah. no question. Because obviously I believe in that pretty yeah. pretty heavily. Yeah, and there's the common <laughs> it's thread. It's pretty good. It's the common thread. Whether it be a for-profit organization or a non-profit organization yes. uh, that you're giving to, the tax yeah. status doesn't matter if you can have a multiplier effect yeah. to, to carry your values in and the I future. And I think also... You know, as you know, we started the Young Professionals Network at, at FWA, and that's for professionals at any line of work within our member firms under 40. And we recognize them with uh, the YP awards, et cetera. And I think that is a, already a way we're giving back by, you know, uh, cultivating that next generation of yeah. leaders uh, yeah. and advisors. And that's pretty cool to see uh, during COVID. Uh, we uh, shipped the awards because we couldn't give them in person. And I remember the recipients um, would take it off camera and then, you know, and then they <laughs> had fun with it. And then they would give a thank you speech. So mm-hmm. when Brooke and Emily finished that up and sent me the link uh, to watch, um, wow, did I get emotional. Hmm. It just hit me. I did not expect I just said, oh, you know, I'm watching this because Brooke wants me to. Hmm. It meant so much to these 25 award winners. Hmm. So yeah. I was kind of a puddle by the time it was yeah. over, right? <laughs> and yet I thought, wow, you know, we're doing something right here. And that was, because it's every two years, right, is the Young Professional yeah. Award. So that was 2020. And it then was. Uh, Jeff DeHaan, one of our partners, uh, which tells his age, he's under 40, uh, was recognized two years ago in 2022 uh, as a young professional by Family Wealth Alliance, and and I can speak firsthand from Jeff, being like that was that was a meaningful that was a meaningful demonstration of his professionalism, what he's done. We all knew it as a firm, right? And the people that he served, well, you knew nominated him, and cool. and having the organization st- uh, step back and go, no, amongst his peer group in the industry, he's a, he's a he's a top well, individual. And, and this year, uh, I know, I think it closed last weekend. Um, I don't know how many nominations we got, hmm. but. It's, 25 spots, right? Yeah. And there's a panel of eight judges, and they decide, not us. And I'm sure the, the list gets longer and longer in terms of nominees. That's incredible. Yeah, every year. Every yeah. year. Yeah. And, including you, ours. Including ours. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so how do you decide, right? Yeah. Because yeah. so, it's so it's, many great it's young pretty neat. people. There's yeah. a real energy amongst that group. And uh, it'll be neat to see that live at this fall forum. And the world is not getting more simple. It's getting more complex over time. Yeah. So, uh, so. I usually wrap up with advice for entrepreneurs, but I want to break it into into twofold. Uh, in your closing thoughts, you know, what would you share as just some feedback, thoughts, and summary for entrepreneurs, uh, but also for end families, um, because because Family Wealth Alliance speaks to the professionals that serve them. What do you want end families to know about firms like Clearwater Capital, like others that are member firms of Family Wealth Alliance? Uh, what would you want to, them to to seek out as they're processing? Here's the kind of firm I would want to be aligned to. So if you can hit those two people and yeah, those your are summary good thoughts, John. Thank you. Um, I think the 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 advice to entrepreneurs is to always remember the why. Mm. That through thick and thin, for me, the north star of why we we're doing this. We place families first. Uh, we connect you. Mm. Uh, that we believe in what we were doing. We didn't know all the time the how uh, mm-hmm. or the what but we knew the why yeah and so that was and and the seminal moments that i had everyone has those right uh and and they're the driver of the why for that entrepreneur so it's it's having the vision it's having the courage to actually make the leap of faith and start a business right mm-hmm. and then it's the fortitude to get it through the early years and, and then the joy of, of seeing it to fruition. So mm. um, I, think, I think the why, and, and, and when it comes to some kind of you know, transition, um, I won't say it's an end game. I don't think my sale to Schwab is an end game. It's just, God, it's just a beautiful beginning. Are you mm. kidding? Mm. I mean, this is when it really starts. <laughs> uh, I don't feel like I've really contributed much. I feel like I have a lot more to contribute. 
going yeah. forward. And that's that's my follow through. That's my velocity and my top spin yeah. that keeps yeah. me going going. So that would be my advice. I think my advice to families in a financial advisor relationship is trust. Hmm. It's all about trust. And if you can't get excited about not only objective advice, but that you're getting the very best advice tailored to you and your family and where you're headed, then you need to find another one because it is a lot better when you have a trusted advisor that gives you not only objective advice, but the best advice. Hmm. And when you're getting the best advice, it hums, it sings, Hmm. and it's awesome. And then you can go on and accomplish so many things with your family wealth. That's Hmm. when it's really cool. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Just, I know I started uh, the conversation this way, but uh, your leadership, um, the impact that you're having, uh, is firsthand, you know, for me, for our team at Clearwater Capital, uh, for the industry more broadly, and and then most importantly, where we give uh, the best hours of all of our days to the families that we're serving, uh, is is you need to know that that is happening and has happened from the day that you founded Family Wealth Alliance till now, and what that means into the future. Uh, thank you, and thank you on behalf of. Not that I have the right to speak on behalf of all the member firms, but I'm going to do it anyway. Thank you on behalf of everyone that's part of Family Wealth Alliance too. Um, it's a it's a joy to be uh, to be included. Uh, it's a joy to get together with peers uh, for the sake of thinking about their why and thinking about something that's bigger than themselves. So thank you, Tom, and uh, for all the listeners. Thank you again for uh, just participating in these clear conversations. If you want to continue the dialogue, please send us an email at clearconversations at ccpwealth.com. Have a blessed day.